morning everyone. So this is a continuation of our review. We're going to be looking at chapter 4 together on bonding and chemical structure. So if you flip open your summary notes here, chapter 4. We spent the first section of this uh, chapter looking at ionic compounds. Uh, believe it or not, this is the only part that we talked about ionic. Some things you want to know about ionic is we can recognize them. Typically it is going to be a bond between a metal and a non-metal. We realize that that's actually not the technical definition of it. The definition of it is between electronegativity between, let's say, two uh, elements, x and y, if the electronegativity difference gets to be, usually we throw around a number of about 1.8. We'll come back to this later on this lesson. But if the tug of war difference is uneven by more than 1.8, the heavier competitor will actually snatch the electron completely, leaving the x, in this case here, as a full positive, and the y having stolen the electron as a full negative. In that case there we get an ionic bond. The ionic bond is going to be the attraction between the positive cations and the anions. Positive is attracted to negative. But charges in general are unstable. The very reason that this thing here can exist is because they actually end up forming what's called a crystal lattice. That word there, crystal, just describes that it's a regular alternating pattern. The lattice structure here just repeats indefinitely. It's positive, negative, positive, negative. Although it's not necessarily one atom on top of the other, sometimes their spacings and their ratios might be a little bit different, but at least we know if I were, let's say, a negative here, I'm going to try to surround myself not only with my partner positive to cancel me out, but I'm going to surround myself with as many pauses around as possible, and uh, vice versa for the positives, surrounding myself with negatives. Because of this repeating uh, lattice structure here, there's no point actually counting the actual number of positives or actual number of negatives. What we do instead is we just do by ratio. This is going to be called a formula unit. A formula unit is sort of like an empirical formula for this lattice. And basically the formula unit indicates, let's say we write the compound NaCl, it's implied that it's one and one if there's no numbers. It's saying even though there may be trillions and trillions of sodiums and chlorines, at least by ratio, every sodium should have one chlorine neighbor. The sodium right beside, we have another chlorine neighbor. That's the formula unit, and that's what we actually use for the molar mass. Because uh, ionic bonds here are fairly strong, and because there's many of them inside this lattice, that amounts to ionic compounds typically having very, very high melting points and boiling points. Because if you imagine trying to heat this up to melt it, it's not impossible, but you need to heat it up upwards of 700, 800 degrees or beyond to try to break up some of these bonds. If I'm having to destroy not only one of these attachments, but another one, but another one, another one, another one, just the sheer number of bonds that I'm trying to break is going to increase the multiple quite a bit. And that actually implies then, in my regular exposure, room temperature pressure, we would expect them to be solids. Uh, ionic compounds are said to have very low uh, volatility for the same reason. Their bonds basically hold these atoms fixed. They don't let any of these atoms here just spontaneously uh, break off. Compare that to the covalent bond case. Covalent bonds, they don't have this lattice structure. So especially in the solid state, they will only have very weak van der Waals or London forces to keep them uh, together. Uh, once you overcome those intermolecular forces, these can re very readily uh, evaporate, uh, volatile. Uh, and also melt away or have already boiled by room temperature. These are not electrically conductive. For electric conductivity, we need two things. One, what we're looking for here is charges. The more charges that you have, the more conductive something can be, but we need charges that are mobile, charges that can move around through the structure. In this case here, we know per sodium and per chlorine, because of the electron transfer, we have developed these charges, but unfortunately in the solid state, the particles themselves are stuck in place and they're just vibrating. So in this case here for ionic, they do have charges, but they're not mobile, so therefore they're not electrically conductive. Compare this to uh, covalent compounds. Covalent compounds don't even have charges. I wouldn't expect uh, solutions of covalent compounds called molecular solutions to be conductive. Metals are conductive for another reason we'll see uh, later on in the section. That's all we basically did for ionic compounds. Um, we switched over. Most of the chapter has been on covalent compounds. Much more interesting when we're dealing with nonmetals bonding with nonmetals. Typically, these guys here are the smaller atoms on their row. They have a higher Z effective. When they tug a war against each other, no one loses really badly. So they end up sharing in electrons. As they share electrons, they're going to still try to satisfy the octet rule. They're going to still try to fill up their outer shell with eight electrons. We can call that a noble gas stability. There's something about having a full shell that keeps you stable, and I'm going to try to share electrons and work my geometry so that everyone has a full shell. A covalent bond here, 
because we don't actually have electron transfer, when we look at an electrostatic attraction, like a positive and negative attraction, the positive for a covalent bond, let's say this is an FF covalent bond, the positive is going to be the positive nuclei of the centers. Two electrons are always going to make up a bond. This one here is now a single bond, so I would have written that FF like this. And in this case here, those electrons are sort of confined between the two fluorine neighbors because the positives like hanging on to those negatives there. There's going to be some compromise between the positive and the nuclei always want to get closer and closer to the electrons, but when the positives get too close together, the positive actually repels another positive. Whatever the compromise here is now going to be referred to as the bond length. Single bonds typically are the longest. As I switch over to double bonds or triple bonds, I switch over to four electrons and six electrons. That increasing negative density between the two centers will end up pulling in the two centers tighter. So in contrast here, let's say an N triple bond, although it's much stronger, the bond length is fairly short. That's where a covalent bond is. No lattice structure because we don't have a full positive or full negative. There's no reason to have alternating charges. We're going to have really, really weak van der Waals forces. We saw that in the last section here. So although I'm covalent bonded in between me, when I'm trying to melt it, I'm actually not destroying the covalent bond. It's a little bit unfair. What I'm trying to do here is, as a solid, we just have, well, this molecule here is nonpolar. The other molecule is also nonpolar. They only have very weak London forces in between. Those background attractions, these positives like some of the negatives on the neighbors, but like I said, these ones here are really, really weak. You don't need to heat up all that much, and this one here is already separated. These intermolecular forces are the forces you're trying to break to make it melt or to make it boil. So by the time you get to room temperature pressure, these are typically going to be gaseous or liquids. Uh, compounds or uh, molecules are also going to be typically going to be gases, really low melting point, low boiling point. Just looking at another molecule here, uh, just some terminology. When you draw a correct Lewis structure, you have to include all lone pairs. Without all these dots here, you might sort of imply, yeah, everything is full and whatnot, but they'll actually mark you wrong if you don't have these extra dots. So make sure for a correct Lewis diagram, even if my electrons are not currently used for bonding, we call those lone pairs or even non-bonding electrons, make sure you draw all the electrons in the diagram. Make sure I show that everyone has eight, except for the exceptions that we'll see shortly. Uh, bonding pairs are going to be the single bonds or double bonds. When we get to our Vesper stuff on the next side, all four electrons in this double bond are squeezed between the two uh, atoms, the S and the O. This one here is going to count as one electron domain. So sure, it's a more electron-rich domain than, say, a single bond, but that's just one area that's negative. Vesper works off a fairly simple principle, starting from the Lewis, if I focus on just one central atom, how many places around the central atom are actually negative? Because negatives repel each other, we're going to maximize the bond angle to try to minimize the repulsion in between these negatives. We then differentiate between orbital or electron domain geometry. If I can see all the orbitals, I can see, oh, this one here is going to be trigonal planar. And yet when I look at the molecule, the molecule is just SO2, it's just this latter part. Sometimes the molecular geometry or the real shape, I would just specify that it's bent uh, and it's based off a trigonal planar. You will need to memorize the names of those shapes as well as the bond angles. We have a summary of them on the back side here. So in drawing Lewis structures here, hopefully you've memorized these rules by now. Remember, there's no chemistry in these rules. These just get us to the right final picture without us really having to uh, try to brute force it, try to figure out how the electrons actually did this. So let me just do an example here. We did triiodide before. First thing that you do is you count up the total number of valence electrons. Valence is the S and P electrons. You just look at the group number. Iodine is a halogen, group 17, or having seven valence electrons. There's three of them, plus the extra one that's arrived because I have an anion. Seven times three, 21 plus one, tells me I should have 22 in my final picture. Instead of brute forcing it, instead of coming along and be like, well, every iodine is supposed to start off with seven, and somehow this iodine is supposed to be bonded together. What I'm going to do, right, this one here, I can predict a single bond, but it's a little bit of a question mark. Well, how is this going to happen? Rather, I'm just going to follow straight the rules. Let's just plot one of them down in the central. Let's already connect the others with a single bond. The single bond is the weakest attachment that we have. If you don't even have a single bond, the whole molecule falls apart. Keep track of your electrons. Every bond is two. So I've used two there. I've used two there. 22, I'm now down to 18. Then I start satisfying this octet rule. Everyone's going to bond until they have a full shell. I don't necessarily know where these electrons came from, but I'm just going to dot them on here. I'm going to work outside to inside. 
So make them happy outside first to inside. I've used six there, six there, 12. I'm now down to six. Working your way inwards, I have these two, these two. For this example molecule, we actually figured out that we have extra electrons. In the case that we have extra electrons, I have two more electrons to put. If you do have extra, you just put them down on a central atom here. That then implies that this central atom actually has an expanded octet. Expanded octets are sort of optional, so iodine can be perfectly happy with eight, say in the I2 molecule, but in the odd molecule, it actually may have more than eight. I didn't need to memorize that. I just used this rule. Oh, I have extra electrons in the bag. Let's just throw them onto the middle. We're going to find that for those expanded octet, it typically has to start occupying the d orbitals, so we're going to be looking at period three and lower. So I don't have any 2d orbitals or 1d orbitals, only when I get to row 3 with sodium to argon's row, the nonmetals there, from there and downwards, like phosphorus and sulfur and selenium and all those, those ones are large enough to actually hybridize some of the d orbitals and actually access those for bonding. This molecule here is charged, so then we can put square brackets around it with the charge in the corner, don't forget that. And then because following the rules here has gotten me to the right final picture, when I look back at my brute force picture, I can sort of rationalize what has happened. At the end of the day, I need to have single bonds in both cases. So I do have a single bond here. To make a single bond here, I need to somehow, well, this iodine in the middle has three lone pairs. Maybe this iodine here pushes the electrons to the side, and the iodine, he's grabbed the extra electron because he has a negative one charge, and it's actually got a dative bond. It's going to take these two electrons, both electrons are coming from one partner, that's going to be a coordinate bond, and that's how the single bond forms. Even though in the rules we do talk about connecting them at least with a single bond, remember if by the time you've run out of electrons, if not everyone has a full octet yet, only then do you start making multiple bonds, double bonds and triple bonds. You might start sharing some of these electrons inside. That keeps the outer atom happy, and it slowly makes the inner atom even more happy. We don't need to do that in this case. This one here is just an expanded octet. With every rule, there's always some exceptions. So we talk about an octet being a full shell, octet being eight. The exception of the full, uh, first shell, first shell is a really tiny shell. It maxes out at two. Don't try to force hydrogen or helium to fully have eight. They're totally happy to have two. Hydrogen's gonna bond until it has paired up that electron. If it doesn't have a paired electron, we refer to this as a radical. Radicals are things that have unpaired electrons. Careful, the terminology here is it's unpaired, but it's not charged. Hydrogen does have the one proton to counterbalance the negative charge, but having this unpaired electron makes it super unstable. It's going to try to react away. It's going to try to pair up this electron very naturally, which is why hydrogen typically forms a diatomic. There are other atoms that have incomplete octets. They're happy with less than eight. These two you just want to memorize here. Beryllium is going to be satisfied with four electrons. That could be worded as beryllium with two single bonds or beryllium with a double bond. Similarly with boron, Boron is most stable when it has six electrons. It could even be one double bond and one single bond. You might find the odd case that boron actually has eight electrons, but it's actually less stable than this configuration. And this is just us going experimentally. Let's look at what it looks like in real life, and then let's make sure that our model is predictive of it because Lewis doesn't quite predict it properly. How come this one here doesn't actually need eight? We're just gonna treat that as an exception. Phosphorus and sulfur, these ones here, first thing to remember is phosphorus can have eight. Sulfur can have eight. There's no problem of it having a regular octet. It's just that many times when we saw compounds, they typically adopted a more than eight configuration. They were actually so generous, they were able to access those d orbitals to actually use them for bonding. From that Lewis structure uh, sort of overview there, we then switched over to uh, VESPER. VESPER stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion. They might ask you, what principle does VESPER work off of? And the principle is actually fairly easy. We're focusing on the electrons in the valence shell. Electrons all have a negative charge, and all they're doing is they're repelling each other. So where the bond angles are going to end up is for electrons to have positions that minimize the repulsions. We try to get the balloons as far away from each other as possible, maximizing those bond angles. We did a ED for electron domain. We identify places that are negative. The thing about Vesper was we could only look at one center at a time. If I have a molecule of multiple centers, I can do it center by center. We then looked at examples of molecules going electron domain geometry starting from two all the way through six. If I have everything as bond angles, the electron domain geometry, how the orbitals are arranged and how the molecule is arranged, the geometry is the same. In case we start getting lone pairs, 
my orbital geometry here, my electron domain geometry might be trigonal planar, but by the time I look at just the molecule, this part here I'd say bent. Remember, by the time you get to a lone pair, the lone pair is more diffuse. It's still there. It's still a negative density. In fact, what's going to happen, that balloon here is going to be larger than the other two balloons. It's going to be squeezing any other two arms tighter than what it was. So in this case here, for a 360 going around, trigonal plane was supposed to be 120. I would imagine some number that's less than 120. Usually, we quote around a number of 117. I've seen this number go down to 106, 105 or so. It just needs to be something smaller than 120. Uh, we talked about the tetrahedral angle. We start introducing that 3D notation. The wedges are used for atoms that are pushed into the page. So this is physically going into the screen. Whereas if I, sorry, that's a dash. If I have a wedge, imagine pulling the X out, pulling it in front of the page. It leaves a shadow behind. This one here is actually jumping off the page at you, out of page. Especially when we got into the organic chemistry here, this became very important to identify the 3D geometry. We looked at SN1, SN2 type reactions, and we saw this stereochemistry might flip. Uh, similarly with bond angle here, just memorize the bond angle 109.5 for tetrahedral, and as things start becoming lone pairs, yes, you still need to know the name for the molecular shape, and just track that the bond angle is a couple degrees smaller. Usually for this one here, I throw around like 107. For water, as an example of a bank compound, 104. You'll notice that both this one here and this one here are bent. Normally, in case the lone pair here isn't super diffuse, normally the bent from the first case will be uh, larger than this one. This uh, four electron domain case already was 109. Squeezing from 109, it's going to be like 104, 105, whereas squeezing from 120 in the three electron domain case, maybe still 117. All right, so. We have some of those orbit geometries. You do need to memorize those names and memorize the bond angles. Usually this happens in a multiple choice question. They'll say, arrange these by increasing bond angle. You'll need to be able to very quickly draw Lewis structures, identify the Vesper, and then be able to track, oh, this one has a small angle, then this one, then this one. Similarly with bond length, uh, single bonds are going to be the longest. They have the least electron density in between. As you go to double bond, triple bond, they get even larger. Uh, we're playing a little bit of catch up here. We saw that Lewis was fine, Vesper built off of Lewis, but we find that the theories of Lewis and Vesper, they don't really jive well with the SPDF stuff we learned back in Chapter 2, Chapter 3. So what we did is we actually need to modify our model one more time. We called this guy here hybridization. Hybridization put these two models together. They really like asking this question here, define hybridization. Try not to use the word, oh, it's hybridizing orbitals together. Try to find another language where like hybrid is like a blend. And what we're doing here is we're mixing our regular atomic orbitals and we're forming, oh, I just told you what not to do here, forming blends. What do we know about these blends here? They redistribute the energy here. When I trade in a certain number, let's say I trade in four orbitals, I'm going to get four orbitals out of it. Some other things you want to might mention here. I know the study guide says with lower energy, I prefer the language of there's intermediate in energy. So they're going to be somewhere in between. Let's say I have s orbitals and p orbitals. Let's say I trade in these three. I would expect to get three blended orbitals. And you'll notice that these three blended orbitals will be energetically somewhere in between. That's what we mean by intermediate energy. It also has better angles for bonding. There was a lot of math behind the scenes. We had to do a lot with those electron wave functions. All we did is we just said, yep, some math happens, and then we just matched it up. Anytime you have sp3 hybridization, I traded in four orbitals, I get four out of them, the geometry actually ends up tetrahedral. We actually worked the other way around. For our Vesper, it was really easy to tell which ones are tetrahedral. If I saw that they're tetrahedral, I automatically came along, oh, the hybridization is sp3. sp3 is always tetrahedral. In a similar fashion here, trigonal planar is going to be sp2, linear is going to be sp. We just matched up from the orbital geometry or the electron domain geometry, we just matched up which type of blend how many orbitals did I need to mix in so that I actually end up uh, getting uh, the, the hybrid orbitals? Remember, with this hybrid orbital language here, we started identifying there's actually two types of bonds. One's called the sigma bond and one's called the pi bond. Make sure you know these two definitions as well. A sigma bond here is the stronger one. It's the head-to-head -head overlap. It's purposeful overlap. It's an orbital directly pointed against another orbital, but it's along the internuclear axis. Don't be too specific here. Don't say it's, oh, it's when two s orbitals directly overlap or an s and a p. It could be a hybrid with a hybrid. It can be a hybrid with a non-hybrid. The key here is it has to have electron density 
on this imaginary between nucleus axis, it has to be overlapping between the two centers. Because that overlap is more significant, a sigma bond is stronger. The pi bond here that we get, let's say this one here is sp2 hybridized, these carbons here have an unhybridized p orbital. Those p orbitals here weren't purposely pointing towards each other. When you actually look actually with a more scaled diagram, when I have p orbitals, they're not purposely pointing towards each other, but because the atoms themselves are close enough, there is going to be overlap above and below. Because this is just one single p orbital, let's say it's a pz orbital, this one here will end up creating one pi bond. Usually you draw that as a little banana. Overlap above and below is just one pi bond, and the pi bond actually amounts to your second bond. So what you're going to say is a sigma is stronger than a pi bond, although by the time we usually have a pi bond, we have like let's say a double bond, a double has one sigma and one pi, and obviously if you have two of them, it's going to be stronger than just having one bond. We saw this in chapter 5 when we looked at our bond enthalpies in table 11. We saw that the sigma bond was stronger, it had a higher number, whereas the pi bond was a slightly smaller number. It didn't take twice the energy to break it. Uh, the pi bond is weaker because it's just side to side overlap. That one there is off the internuclear axis, so we say sideways overlap, but it's not along the internuclear axis. For some reason, on the curriculum guide, they always say you want to know this name. This is essentially another wording of hybridization. This is called by forming molecular orbitals, we make molecular orbitals from what's called a linear combination of atomic orbitals. Basically, for hybridization, so far I've taken carbon as an atom, was supposed to have its own SMPs. I pre-blended them before it actually bonded with H. For hybridization, for these sigma and pi orbitals, which are examples of them, for this uh, molecular orbital theory, what we start doing is we say, well, you have a hybrid orbital and you have a hybrid orbital. What if I blend those two orbitals together? What if I take the sigma to sp2 orbital from the one carbon, and what if I linearly combine it? A linear combination in the middle here is just going to be a simple plus or a simple minus. So what if I just blend? This time I'm hybridizing again, but I'm hybridizing the carbon on the left side with the uh, blended orbital with the carbon on the right side. I'm taking the equation that defines this orbital and this orbital. I'm adding them together, and I'm getting lots of math behind the scenes. I'm getting my sigma orbital as a blend between the two of them. So there's an example of them, the 1s and the 1s. When I blend them together, I can get one that's a sigma. Usually in science, things are symmetrical. If we have one that's a bonding molecular orbital, it's more stable. We actually have one that's anti-bonding. We can identify those with the star. When we looked at the oxygen paramagnetism, it got a little strange here, especially when we get three p orbitals. I have, let's say, px and px are purposely pointed towards each other. Those will give me the sigma and the sigma star. When I start looking at the py and the pz, these ones here were all 90 degrees off. These ones here will be off the internuclear axis. When I combine the py and the py, when I do that linear combination, again, I'll form a pi orbital that's more stable be for the green and for the blue. But if I instead subtract them, Normally, equations, when you subtract them, you'd imagine that it's zero. But in this case here, these equations are super complicated that when I actually subtract them, sure, I just end up with a slightly less stable one here. For every pi uh, bonding orbital, I actually get a pi star bonding orbital as well. We don't need to know too, too much in terms of this molecular orbital theory. You just need to know this name. How did we make the molecular orbital theory? Is this linear combination? I basically hybridized again, but hybridized orbitals between two different atoms and sigma and pi bonding, these uh, bonding or anti-bonding orbitals now belong to both centers. Continue onwards here, we saw for a few molecules they show resonance. Resonance, if you're going to define it here, it's talking about an electron delocalization. It's talking about electrons actually being shared over multiple centers. We saw this when we did molecules. Uh, let's do the molecule NO2. Um, in this case here, let's do minus, okay? So I'm gonna follow my rules here. I have an N and an O, okay? I plop down the electrons. By the time I get to the NO, uh, NO2 minus, this is the molecule I get. The N is not an incomplete octet. It's not happy right now. I've run out of electrons. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my electrons in. The question here is, well, it could have been this electron here on the left side that got shared, or it could have been the electron on the right-hand side that got shared. At first, it may look like these two are identical, but it is make a difference. If really the double bond was for the left-handed oxygen or for the right-handed oxygen, in reality, because those electrons can be in two different places, what we're going to say is 
these two uh, drawings, Lewis structures or resonance forms, neither of these two molecules are actually correct. Our real molecule, when I join them with the double-headed arrow, our real molecule is some combination of these two. It's some resonance hybrid. What I'm picturing here is N, it at least is going to have a single bond, but those two electrons that make up the double bond, you can't really put your finger on it because those two electrons actually shared over all three centers. Oh, sorry, all, yeah, all three centers there, the O and the N and the O there. And in this case there, instead of trying to draw really a single bond and a double bond, one long arm, one short arm, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to share it and I'm actually going to do bond order instead. I'm going to define for you a number. If it really were a single bond, it's bond order one. If it really were a double bond, bond order two. In this case here for my diagram, I have one, two, three pairs of electrons, not domains this time, but I have three pairs of electrons around the nitrogen being shared over two different directions. This gives me a bond order 1.5, which is exactly between a single and a double bond. It's not quite as strong as a double bond, but not also quite as short as a double bond as well. The reason why we want to get into that bond order is some molecules actually have a bond order of, let's say, 1.33. 1.33 will be weaker than a 1.5, so the decimal actually matters, although it's just a representation of how much it's shared. Having resonance always adds stability. So in the organic chapter that we did, uh, we found that reactions that actually produce compounds that have resonance, uh, typically those reactions uh, will happen to a greater extent. In the organic chapter, uh, we actually saw that if it was a more stable molecule, it actually did have a sort of a uh, correlated impact with, oh, if it forms a more stable product, it actually produces more quickly. But in general, we try to keep chapter five, the energetics, the how, com how complete the reaction is, and chapter six, our reaction kinetics, our speed uh, as a separate concept. Things can be really spontaneous, things can happen 100%, but it can be a very slow reaction, say rusting. Rusting naturally happens, but it's a very slow reaction. Rate is something totally different from a stability argument. They did ozone as an example. Ozone is also another example that has a uh, resonance structure. For ozone, we know around the Earth, we have an ozone layer. There's a natural replenishing of ozone. As we have the sun shining down with all its different forms of radiation, uh, we uh, specifically track the UV radiation in this case here. UV is going to be beyond the violet, so it's going to be shorter than the 400 nanometer wavelength. Starting from UV A, B, C, we're gradually getting increasing energy. Because ozone also has a bond order of 1.5, we're going to find that ozone naturally breaks up with uh, this UVB radiation. So if the ozone molecules absorb some of that UVB radiation, uh, that UVB radiation doesn't really get to us. This is where we are, and that ozone layer forms a natural protection. Uh, there's worries that... Um, uh, because of human sources and a lot of waste products we're tossing into the atmosphere, there are places, especially over the Arctic, that the ozone layer is actually getting very thin. And in that case there, the ozone is not replenishing nearly as quick as it needs to to actually form a protective layer. We actually see this reaction here. Uh, old refrigerators, we use CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. They're made out of CLs, Fs, and Cs. And basically what would happen here is if I had a chlorofluorocarbon, this one here is a whole family of molecules, but if we look at this one here in particular, we're going to find that the CCL bond is energetically weaker than the CF bond. This bond here rips apart. We end up forming a chloride radical, and then the chloride radical basically goes off to kill the ozone. Unfortunately, the chloride radical gets regenerated at the end of this mechanism. Now the chloride is ready to cycle back. This is a, called the chain reaction. It just keeps cycling back and forth. One chloride radical may actually destroy thousands and thousands of ozones before actually recombining. Um, it's fair game for them to actually say, quote, the radical reactions in the atmosphere. Uh, the anode radical is another example of uh, something that um, uh, depletes the ozone layer. As we switch over to the last little bit here in the bonding chapter, we saw electron activity in the last section. This is the tendency to tug of war electrons in bonds. We were looking at electron activity difference between two elements. So let's say X. Typically, we do say for metals, the atom itself is large. The uh, effective nuclear charge is low. When we try to compare it with a nonmetal, these ones here are going to be higher Z effective, a smaller radius. Because of that, their electron activities might be fairly different. So in this case here, let's say electron activity of this one here is 1, and electron activity of this one here is 4. Electron activity is on something called the Pauling scale as no units. But basically, the bigger the number, the more electronegative, the hungrier it is. 
I'm not really concerned with the absolute electron activities. We're going to see this on this triangle diagram in a second here. But what we're interested in is the difference in electron activity. Bigger number minus smaller number says the y wins in this case here. And we usually, again, throw around a number of 1.8. If the tug of war is uneven by anything more than 1.8, Basically, the denominator is pulling so hard, snatches the electron completely, and only in that situation, like we said already, the x becomes a positive, the y becomes a negative. Even though we were supposed to share electrons, the electrons is completely transferred. Let's compare the opposite case here. Let's compare y against y. So this could be fluorine against fluorine when I have 4.0, 4.0. The electron activity difference here is actually just zero. Because it's zero, that implies that nobody really loses. And because nobody really loses, we're going to have a perfect 50-50 sharing. This is the best case of sharing. When we have nonpolar, there's no imbalance. Every, the electrons spend equal time on the left side and the right side. We can have a whole assortment of different tug of wars here. Let's say between x and y. Let's say we have a 4.0 and I have something that's a 3.2. I'm going to have created a polar bond, a dipole. We point towards the winner, and the difference there is actually 0.8. I just pulled out this diagram here from the option section, from option A, we never did this. But in this case here, the reason why this 1.8 number isn't always going to be 1.8, because it actually really depends on this diagram here, section 29, it actually plots the difference in electron activity. It plots these values here, difference of 3, difference of 0.8, difference of 0. So small difference is 0. We would expect 0 to be sort of covalent or nonpolar. We'd expect anything beyond 1.8. Right, 1.8 here, we'd expect it to be ionic, so that's how you read that axis. What they're plotting it against is actually the average electron activity. Now this guy here is actually a little bit crazy, but what it's all is trying to do is try, is try to say, well, there's a couple ways I can get a difference of zero. I can have, let's say, a fluorine fighting against a fluorine. That's a difference of zero. In that case there, fluorine is four, fluorine is four, the average between fours, the average is also four. That's going to be at a four. That's going to be non-metal fighting against non-metal, 100% of a covalent bond. But what if I had like Na and Na? I don't remember off the top of my head what the number is, but if Na fights against itself, that difference is also zero. We definitely don't call an Na-Na bond covalent. Well, this is a metal and a metal because the average is going to be something lower. It's going to be something like 0.9 or 1.0 or so. Having a difference of zero still puts you in the metallic section instead of covalent. So depending on this average electron heavy, depending on their absolute numbers, it might actually scale me a little bit along this x-axis. Typically speaking, most of our averages are somewhere in the middle here. So therefore, when we have our difference, sometimes 1.8 actually acts as a nice difference when it crosses over from polar to ionic. Sometimes it's a little bit lower than that. Uh, it'll depend on the real compound. We don't need to look at that triangle diagram, but I just wanted to flush that out for you a little bit. As we look at this uneven sharing here, we get what's called a polar bond. We get a polarity. We get one side kind of positive, one side kind of negative. We always point this dipole. The dipole represents that there's a charge separation. The positive is uh, in a different location as the negative. It creates a dipole moment. This is definitely going to be a polar bond. It's possible that your molecule has polar bonds, but based on the geometry, we might actually have that polarity canceling out. So case in point here, let's look at carbon dioxide. First thing you would do is you would figure out, do we have polar bonds? Let's look at the tug of wars individually. <clears throat> Between C and O, O wins. O is more electronegative, is closer to fluorine. Yes, we have a polar bond. This side's trying to get more negative. This side's trying to get more positive. Same thing on this side here. We have a polar bond. The oxygen side wins. This one here is going to be IR sensitive in our uh, spectroscopic chapter here. But overall, if you were in the middle and you were being pulled equally hard on either side, we're going to find that both arrows cancel out sort of like the vector addition stuff you've done in physics here, because the vectors cancel out, overall we're actually nonpolar. So for my whole molecule, they might just say polar or nonpolar. You're not just going to be interested in whether I have polar bonds or not. Yes, I do have a polar bond, but based on your geometry, usually if it's symmetrical, the shape is set up to cancel. And because the shape cancels out the dipoles, no net dipole will end up being a nonpolar compound. One outcome of polarity and nonpolarity is solubility. When the things dissolve in other things, we can just summarize that fairly nicely with like dissolves like. Polar things dissolve in other polar things. Uh, ionic is sort of an extreme of polar. Polar means there's a slight imbalance. We have a kind of negative, kind of positive, kind of negative. But by the time the tug of war difference gets to be more and more and more dramatic, we're going to have eventually transferred the electron. Only at that point does X get a full positive, Y gets a full negative, meaning these partial charges are just fractional charges.
So solubility was one outcome of it. If you want something to be more soluble, if the thing is polar, more ionic and more polar things would dissolve in a polar solvent. If you want things to be immiscible like oil and water, oil typically has long carbon chains that are nonpolar, water is then a polar compound, and then that doesn't dissolve very well. Last part here in chapter 4, one other outcome of uh, polarity here is their intermolecular forces, the IMF. This part here we analyze in terms of melting point and boiling point because these ones here were physical changes. We're not actually trying to break up the compound, we're just trying to be able to separate one molecule from another molecule. If molecules hold themselves together well, if there's a lot of in-between attractions, we'd expect higher temperatures, higher boiling points are needed to actually shake this hard enough to actually separate these bonds. So we have this illustration between the stronger the intermolecular forces as I go th 1 through 3 here, the more increased the melting point and boiling points are. Let's go through them in succession here. First one, we used to call them van der Waals forces. Van der Waals nowadays is the umbrella term. Van der Waals will cover the London forces. It's going to cover dipole-dipole. It's only hydrogen bonding that's off in its own category. So for London forces, we typically look at nonpolar molecules like fluorine and fluorine, Remember when I take solid fluorine, it's a little weird to think about that because nonpolar compounds typically are gases, but at the solid state, the particles here are just vibrating in place here. They just have some background attractions. The positive not just likes the negative on its own molecule, the positive likes the negative on its neighbor. There are some background attractions that we just can't get away from, but it's fairly weak, so it doesn't take a lot of temperature. I think this one here melts at negative 50, negative 60 degrees or so, and it's even boiled by the time uh, it's at room temperature. These London forces here are the only thing nonpolar molecules have. We talked about an extra mechanism. Even though these electrons are perfectly nonpolar, they're perfectly 50 50 splitting, electrons swish and swash. So if the electrons at this point here happen to switch to one side, we're going to develop a temporary dipole. That side's kind of negative, that side's kind of positive. Because of this temporary dipole, it can also induce, it can also cause a dipole in my neighbor, and I can also have an incre increased attraction between these partial poles. So uh, in that case there, that just adds an extra mechanism. The key words for this one here are they're temporary or they're instantaneous. These dipoles don't last for very long. A split second later, the electrons would switch the opposite way. No more dipole, but now it's going to create dipoles in a whole bunch of other neighboring molecules. For these ones here, what you want to track is these ones here are stronger the more charges that you have. Compare fluorine when compare iodine. Iodine, although is a much larger atom, when we think about Coulomb, the larger radius actually implies that the attraction is weaker, but iodine has way more positives than fluorine. That means it also has way more negatives. Just the sheer number of attractions that we have are going to uh, hold these two molecules together. Iodine actually stays a solid at room temperature. The melting point has increased such that even by room temperature or so, it hasn't even melted yet. We usually track this in terms of the size. So if I have a higher mass, typically it means I have either larger elements or I have um, uh, um, more charges. Um, so the more charges would imply the stronger attraction. Uh, the next one here also covered under Van der Waals is called the dipole-dipole attraction. These are sort of moderate or medium in strength here. These ones here typically are polar. In fact, polar molecules actually do have London forces as well, but because a dip-dip or dipole-dipole force is stronger, usually you just quote the strongest one. So let's say I have an HI and an HI. This is that sort of middle category here. These ones here are polar compounds. These ones here always have a dipole. They're permanent. I'm not relying on this electron swishing and swashing to create that split second dipole. The dipole is always there. And because the dipole is always there, there's always going to be interaction between the negative side of the dipole and the positive side of the other dipole. That force in between is called the dipole-dipole, even though we're having to look inside confirming that it's polar before I figure out the in-between in force. Hydrogen bonding is actually just a very special case of this dipole-dipole. You'll only get it when you have a very uh, uneven tug-of-war. You'll only get it when H is directly bonded to N, O, or F. Even if they're one atom away, let's say I have an aldehyde, C double one, H, and O like this, that's not going to be a hydrogen bond. That's just going to be a dipole. It's going to be a dip-dip. But what if I had something like water? As the 3D structure shows, this one molecule here is actually bent. We have H fighting against O directly. The H loses really badly. Sure, there are parts of the dipole that will cancel out, but in this case here, look at the tug of war difference. O is about 3.4, hydrogen is about um, 2.2, I think it is. So overall, huge dipole. This side here is very, very negative, and this side here is very, very positive. 
This one here is not the hydrogen bond. Don't tell me water has two hydrogen bonds. Don't qualify how many, but you're going to say when water is nearby another water, these huge dipoles, when they interact, the negative side of this likes the positive side, the uh, negative side of this one here likes the positive side. It's these in-between attractions that we call the H-bond. So we can't actually specify how many hydrogen bonds because that's actually going to depend on size and how many molecules are around. But at least having access to hydrogen bond, it's the strongest IMF, so therefore the highest melting point boiling point on the order of 50 degrees, 60 degrees harder to melt than say I didn't have hydrogen, uh, hydrogen bond. A few last cases here are special bonding here. Metallic bonding, metals, if you remember, because they're on the left-hand side of the periodic table, metals generally are the largest in the row. Because they have a large radius, you can explain that here, large radius is because they have a low Z effective, you can comment that these ones here, that means I have low ionization. It's really easy to remove electrons, and we have a very low electronegativity as well as electron affinity, not easy to regain. So electrons in this situation really feel unloved here. They're not really held very tightly to any metal center. In fact, metals hold these electrons so loosely, you give them a bump. Unlike this picture that we're assuming, every metal should have its electrons, any one of these electrons are really easy to be dislodged, low ionization energy. Once the electrons are swimming around, the metals really don't have a chance to actually pull them back. These electrons end up forming a pool of electrons. That's where we get our charges that can move. We call that, again, delocalization. Just like in the resonance structure here, charges that can move would then imply that this is conductive. Metallic bonding is a Coulomb attraction at the end of the day. So when we think of F is KQQ R squared, as my metal itself, as I'm able to pick up more charges, whether that's an actual like positive one or positive two, or just more protons in the core as I step across the elements, or as the radius shrinks, small radius, higher charges, would imply a stronger force of attraction in between the centers, and therefore a higher melting point. So in chapter three, we saw, at least for the metal section here, the melting point increase as the size of the atom shrunk. Uh, we do also refer to this as non-directional bonding, because the electrons are already in a pool, they're actually in a sea, they're actually not tying any given metal together. So when you take a hammer to them, uh, basically layers will slide really easily into other layers without breaking any bonds, which is why it tends to be very flexible in terms of malleable or ductility. Metals can form what are called alloys. We can melt metals into other metals or even add the odd non-metals, and basically we'll get a combination of properties. Typically alloys, however, are a little more stiff because atoms of different sizes, those layers are not so easy to squeeze into each other unlike the uh, uniform case. Lastly here, we have our term here. Allotrope is a general word, like on the order of isotope or ion. Allotrope is having a different structure. It's like those structural isomers that we saw, but in this case here, we're just a pure element. We're not even a compound. We're even in the same state. So the example that we used was carbon as a solid. Carbon actually as a solid comes to us in multiple different forms. You do need to be able to quote some of these allotropes. So diamond, graphite, uh, fullerene and you need to specify in each structure what does it look like. So in this case here, carbon. Uh, for diamond, carbon is tetrahedrally bonded. Use that wedge in the dash notation. It has the best of both worlds. It has the strength of a covalent bond, but it has a nice network. So having to melt this one here, you're having, having to break every single covalent bond in the structure, but every carbon is then bonded to four other carbons. This is gonna be very, very hard to melt. Uh, so SV3 hybridization bonded to four other neighbors. Really hard to melt. Quartz and silica with silicon dioxide also forms this sort of structure. I know I write it SiO2, but by the time you actually draw it, it's actually Si bonded to four other neighbors. There's just some other lone pairs so that by ratio, every Si is like having two oxygen neighbors. Let's compare that really high melting case, really hard natural mineral. Let's compare it to graphite. Graphite actually has two different types of bonds. We have one type of bond. We have sp2 hybridization, trigonal planar bonding. We usually call this a sheet of carbon. The graphite is actually a bunch of these sp2 hybridized sheets, but this one here, because it's just carbon and carbon, this one here is nonpolar. We just have very, very weak London forces in between. So while the strength of the sheet is very strong, as you stroke your pencil out across a piece of paper, you're actually separating off layers and layers of carbon on the piece of paper. Uh, and basically, if you have an eraser, try to pick up the pencil. It just needs to be more attractive for those graphite sheets uh, than the paper itself.
graphite is conductive because being sp2 hybridized, every single carbon has a p orbital that's not being used. When electrons get up into these pi orbitals, it doesn't really stay put. It doesn't really form a double bond at any point. But again, I have charges that can delocalize, spread throughout, and therefore conductive. Graphene is the name for one of these sheets. It has all the nice properties of graphite. A lot of the new circuitry is trying to be defined uh, with graphene. And lastly here, taking that graphene sheet here, if you roll it up into a cylinder, you get a carbon nanotube. Uh, carbon nanotubes are typically used for catalysts. Or we can wrap them up into a soccer ball. C60 and C72 are the most common soccer balls that we have. These ones here are actually individual. Although the soccer ball itself will have 60 carbon atoms, it's a macromolecule, it's a network solid, but between one soccer ball and say another soccer ball here, they really only have very weak London forces. They're not a huge network kind of throughout, so therefore these ones here typically are much easier to melt than even the graphite or the diamond. These ones here, unfortunately the P orbitals are all pointed every which way. It's a little bit harder for those electrons to get delocalized. So for fullerene, it's all these hexagons and pentagons here, but because of the geometry, it's not so easy for charges to jump. So we expect it to be not conductive. So hopefully that's a review of chapter four. If you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks guys.